Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's deep dive video, we will be exploring, playing, and reviewing the Waterworld board game by Milton Bradley. So without further ado, let's prep the playing board, roll some dice, and get those pawns moving into position. Released in 1995 alongside the film, the Waterworld board game was published by the Milton Bradley Company. Milton Bradley has an interesting history going back to the 1860s when the company first found success printing lithographs of a beardless Abraham Lincoln, and then more long-term success with the production of their first board game, The Checkered Game of Life, which sold over 45,000 copies in the first year and set a path for the company going forward. The Milton Bradley Company created portable games for soldiers in the American Civil War and then towards the end of the 19th century began manufacturing children's games as well as other creative materials for children to learn with, like paint and geometric blocks. Fast forward 125 years, the Milton Bradley Company survived multiple world wars, economic turndowns, and the advent of television, but in 1984 was bought out by Hasbro, ending the company's family ownership. Hasbro continued to create games under the Milton Bradley branding until 1998 when Hasbro also acquired Parker Brothers and rebranded all of their gaming enterprises under Hasbro Gaming. So, going back to the Waterworld board game, this is actually one of the very last Milton Bradley branded board games to be released. And movie tie-in board games can be sort of a mixed bag with the all too common legacy board games like Monopoly being reskinned with various film licenses. But less common are the artisanally crafted movie board games that take the essence of the film and transform it into a tabletop experience, from its aesthetics to its game mechanics. And this is a tradition that has existed for decades as we'll see with Waterworld, but has had an uptick in recent years with smaller tabletop gaming companies creating new board games in the theme of time-honored movie properties like Jaws, Aliens, and The Thing, just to name a few. But with that introduction and background out of the way, let's have a look and explore the inner workings of the Waterworld board game. Taking a peek at the box itself, we are welcomed with this large triangular version of the Waterworld logo and the stencil style Mariner and Atoll, very similar to the graphics found on the Kenner Waterworld action figures. And note the Milton Bradley logo here at the corner. On the back of the box, we get a photograph of the game in action and the tagline, Sink the D's and find land. And on the side, an alluring description of the gameplay to unfold, as well as a list of the included contents. Opening up the box, we are welcomed with all the gaming goods inside. For players opening a factory sealed box for the first time, some light assembly is required, which is detailed in the instruction manual. The contents of the Waterworld board game includes one game board, 8 trimaran pawns, 1 deeds tanker, 12 atoll pieces, 19 tokens, 36 cards, 4 dice, and 1 compass. Before beginning a round of the game, a bit of quick setup is necessary. First, the compass piece is used to randomly select the secret location of dry land. While holding the compass face down, players randomly line up one of the front notches with a notch on the back plate, securing the location with the white clip and setting it aside without anyone peeking. I think that the compass piece is really one of the highlights of the game. Its large size and nice rendering of Enola's tattoo really make it feel like a special item to be obtained by the end of the game. The next step in setting up the game is to take 11 random tokens plus the single dirigible token and mix them up face down, placing the 7 remaining tokens to the side for later. Players then place each of the 12 shuffled tokens face down on the top of each of the 12 atolls. And just check out the illustration work on these atoll pieces. They have so much nice detail that really adds to this sort of traditional board game feel. More on the game's illustrations in just a moment, but for now, players will place the 12 atoll pieces on the specified board locations that are shown in the instruction manual. The game board consists of a grid system with letters for longitude and numbers for latitude. 
The D's pawn is placed on space F6 directly in the middle of the game board, and two, three, or four trimaran pawns, depending on the number of players, start from the different colored corners. Finally, in preparation to begin, the cards are shuffled and three cards are given to each player, making sure to keep them secret from each other. The rest of the cards create a face-up draw pile with a face-down discard pile next to it. But before launching into the gameplay, I just want to have a second to take a closer look at the actual board itself. I have to imagine that the game designers may have been a bit stumped on how to convey the endless oceans of Waterworld in game board form, and I think their solution is fairly good, choosing to show us the underwater world with these illustrations of roaming whale fins and the sunken city which actually depicts the skyline of Denver, Colorado, the real world city that the underwater city in the film is modeled after. A very nice nod to some really deep Waterworld lore. Going back to the gameplay, the overall objective is to reach the secret dry land space with a completed card collection, which includes an Enola card, a Guns card, a Rope card, and a Trimoran Supplies card. Cards are collected either by landing on an Atoll or another person's pawn. Once a player has completed the card collection, that player can destroy the Ds to obtain the compass with the location to dry land. However, once that location is known, other players can intercept the compass's information by landing on that player, but more on all that in just a moment. On a player's turn, they must always roll one white die and move their pawn up to the number of spaces rolled, meaning that a player must move at least one space but does not have to move the full count. Players can move from one space to any other connected by a white line, so no diagonals here, and a player's pawn can pass over other pawns, atolls, or the Ds, counting them as a single space or choose to land on these pieces, occupying the same space. For most of the game, you are attempting to obtain cards. However, a player can only have four cards in their hand at a time. Any extras, which are the player's choice, must be placed face down in the discard pile. And I just have to note that it's kind of funny that there are multiple Enola cards and that every player must obtain an Enola card because the game seems to be reducing this character down to a supply pickup and implying that there are many Enolas within Waterworld. And yeah, I guess kind of in the same vein, it's sort of strange that there are four identical Trimorans sailing about Waterworld as well. But regardless, cards are obtained in two different ways. One is if the player moves onto an atoll. The face down token is flipped up and if it's a card matching token, that player obtains that card from the draw pile. The token remains face up for others to land on. However, not all Atoll tokens are card matching. There's also the Smoker Attack token. When a player flips a Smoker Attack token, they must remove it from the Atoll and place it face down in the extra tokens pile and take another token at random and place it upon the empty Atoll. Now, if the Ds is already destroyed, then the following is ignored, but if not, the Ds is moved to any other Atoll of the player's choice, which destroys the Atoll, taking it out of the game, and if another player's pawn is occupying that Atoll, then they also lose a card of their choice. So the Ds can really be weaponized in the game, and it must be noted that the Ds can win if all 12 Atolls are destroyed, which automatically ends the game. The other non-card matching token, which I've already mentioned, is the dirigible token, which allows any player that lands on that atoll to move their pawn to anywhere else on the board, including other atolls or spaces occupied by other players. Which brings me to the second way to obtain cards in the game, by landing on other players' pawns, which can initiate a card trade. Two drifters meet, something needs to be exchanged. I know the card. But I'll give you this one for free. Or, at this point, the player can choose to pick up the top face down card from the discard pile. And I think this trade gaming mechanic is an excellent bit of flavoring that really fits into the Waterworld universe, as in the film we see that drifters survive by trading at atolls or trading with one another. Okay, now that we know all about obtaining the cards, let's talk about a few special game mechanics and the final race to dry land. 
At the beginning of any turn, a player can choose to raise their sails by swapping out the trolling trimaran pawn with the trimaran pawn that's under full sail. This allows the players to roll both white dice during their turn. However, if another player ends their turn on your pawn, you permanently lose your sails, so it's very important to save this ability for when it matters the most, which is most likely the end of the game once the compass has been obtained. And let's just have a look at those two variations of the trimaran pawns, exquisite hand-drawn illustrations once again, and you just have to love how the game weaves the iconic trimaran transformation into its actual gameplay. But this now brings me to the moment of the attack on the Ds. Once a player has all four cards, they can start moving towards the Ds. When they end their turn on the Ds, they reveal their completed card collection. The player to the left is given the two red dice. They will be playing the part of the Ds in the battle. The attacking player will roll the two white dice as they roll the two red dice. If the attacking player rolls higher than the Ds, it's destroyed. If they roll lower, then they place one of their cards into the discard pile and their turn ends. And again, let's just have a moment to look at this D's pawn, another beautiful illustration that takes some liberties with the design, adding these atoll looking structures on the bow of the ship which I actually really adore. If the D's is destroyed, then it is removed from the game, and that player then obtains the compass. They now know the secret location of dry land, and can begin racing towards it. If another player ends their turn on your pawn before you can make it to dry land, then they too learn the location, and may create a setback through a forced trade. Remember, you need all four cards to win. But regardless, the first person to end their turn on dry land with a completed card collection wins. But enough with the ins and outs of the rules of the game, we must know, how does the game actually play? Well, to find that out, I invited over Rick and Julia Ingham from the Mad Max Minute podcast for a good old fashioned water apocalypse throwdown. After a spirited round of the game, mostly due to Rick and Julia being charismatic house guests, I defeated the D's but ultimately Julia won, arriving at dry land first with all four cards. And I think that we all agreed after the game that it was over incredibly quickly. Our round only lasted about 25 minutes, even with quite a bit of conversation in between turns. And during our discussion after the game, we talked quite a bit about how small the board felt. Once I laid out the board and got a good look at it, it feels small. I think I only had maybe one or two rolls where I was out in the ocean. Mm. I was mostly bouncing from A tool to A tool to A tool. That's true. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot to be said for the layout of the board because each player starts in a corner and each player has three A tools that are very close by. So you can spend mm. the first three, four rounds just hanging out in your own little area mm -hmm. and allowing each player to uncover what the resources are. And then it becomes an issue of crisscrossing the board for Enola or rope or anything that you might need. Yeah. It did feel like we were kind of just meandering through a tight little neighborhood of atolls yeah. there. All, you yes. didn't get that feeling of expansiveness, I, I agree. But regardless of the quick playthrough or the slightly confined feeling of the board, I have to say there were plenty of things that we enjoyed about our experience. It almost goes without saying that we all greatly enjoyed the overall Waterworld look and feel of the game, from the beautifully illustrated gaming pieces to the core mechanics like acquiring supplies through the atolls or trade with one another, to the overall quest to destroy the Ds and find dry land. Rick and Julia also pointed out a few of their own personal favorite mechanics as well. I love the random, I love the compass. 
you randomly spin the compass and that tells you where dry land is mm. and then that is a secret you have to earn access to that secret mm. and then that makes you a target for the other players because now they have to go through you to get that secret mm. really love that mechanic yeah that your objective kind of changes like i'm going to destroy the d's oh no 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 now i need to find the player that has the compass yeah yeah I, mean, I love the compass, and the actual object of the compass is fantastic. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> I really enjoyed the shifting of focus from, oh, I need to destroy that, to, oh, now I need to, it, you know, it it taps into the race aspect Yeah. of, we all need to get to one point before everybody else aspect of the game. And for that reason, I loved the sails. Mm. The ability to say, okay, at the beginning of my turn, I'm turning on my sails. And you only get that one activation. Mm -hmm. But that's where a bit of skill came in, is I chose to put on my sails so that I could go get that Enola card. Mm. Perhaps, yeah, that's the most meaningful decision you can yeah, make, is, is when, when to deploy the sails. Yes. And that ability to make some crucial decisions throughout the game is critical to a player's enjoyment, especially considering that much of the game from the dice rolling to the shuffling of the cards and tokens is all luck based. As far as suspenseful moments of gameplay, something that we all agreed on is that the D's did not pose as large a threat as we had anticipated or hoped for. I really love the mechanic of the D's can destroy angels mm -hmm. yeah. and just completely wipe them off the map. I wish that mechanic were a little bit more aggressive. In our playthrough, we hit two uh, attack tokens pretty early in the game, so we lost two atolls. Didn't slow us down mm. <laughs> at all. <laughs> in the rules, yeah. it does state that it is possible to lose the game. If the Ds destroys enough atolls, if no one is able to get all of the resources that they need, then the game ends and the D's is declared the winner. It's like the secret fifth player when you're playing a four player game. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I could actually picture a game where the D's destroys all 12. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of atolls to destroy. That it is. seems like it would have to be a much longer game yeah. for, uh, for that to actually play out. Yeah. But regardless of the fairly non-threatening Ds, we all enjoyed the second stage of the game, the race to dry land. And I could see that, at least in design, the race to dry land could create a lot of drama and moments of sabotage in the final leg of the game. I would say that the most player interaction we had was once you had uncovered the coordinates to dry land mm. and we all had our sails up there was that strategy of like, okay, whose sails do I drop? Right, yeah. You know, who's the biggest threat to me? Because everybody had our sails up. You dropped my sails, and then Julia dropped your sails. Mm -hmm. And by the time it worked out, Julia was the only one with her <laughs> sails up. So there was, there was a little bit of like interesting <laughs> strategy involved to it, for sure. Now, mm. we never turned over the dirigible token, so we never got to use it, but it does warp you to wherever you want to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you know dry land and you have all the resources, then it's a game winning turnover. And towards the end of our discussion, we did talk about some alternative strategies that we could take in future playthroughs. Rick offered this interesting approach. I imagine that if you want to try alternative strategies, I think the game wants you to go from atoll to atoll, but there is a strategy where you can just keep chasing down other players and Ooh. when you land on them, trying to piece together your hand from what other people oh, have already collected. Point, yeah. Because that puts all of the responsibility, or maybe blame would be a better word, <laughs> on the other players who are revealing atolls. So yeah. if you get to the end of the game and half of the atolls are gone, you can say, well, hey, I just took resources off of you guys. I'm not the reason why half the atolls are gone. Because <laughs> I didn't un unveil those cards. That's true. We also talked about some tweaks to the game or some house rules that could potentially improve some of the game's shortcomings. To slow down the game and potentially create more suspense, I think that swapping out the two white six-sided dice with these pyramid-shaped four-sided dice could make the board feel larger and more expansive, not to mention make the Ds much more powerful when you go to face off against it. 
We also felt that more smoker attacks from the Ds would create more action-packed gameplay, and Julia came up with this twist on the rules that would allow that to happen. Is that when you land on an atoll, you turn the token over, you collect the resources on that token. Mm -hmm. In the rules, you then leave that token in place face up, and other people can visit that atoll, collect rope. Mm -hmm. I think it would actually be a very interesting mechanic if that rope token was then put back in the token pile and a new random unknown mm. token was put into play mm. so that we continued to have unknowns. It would definitely heighten the danger factor of this game because That's what it means. the Ds probably would have come more into play if we had more tokens flipping more frequently. But I think that all in all, we had a good time playing the Waterworld board game, and I asked my guests if they would recommend the game or play it again themselves. I would absolutely play this game again. I would be interested in tweaking the rules of this game mm -hmm. to make it last longer. Yeah. It was kind of too quick, went too fast. It needs some house rules, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It needs house rules. These needs to be more aggressive. It needs to be more than a threat. I want to play this game and lose to the Ds. If you can get your hands on it, I mean, I would absolutely recommend for someone with a board game collection to add this to their collection because this is not really like any other game that I've played. There don't strike me as many other board game options that have these specific mechanics. Mm -hmm. So it felt unique. You can play up to four and it, like Julia said, Maybe as a downside, it's only 20 minutes, but 20 minutes might also just be an upside. Absolutely. Maybe. You don't have to spend three hours uh -huh. <laughs> like the Ulysses cut. <laughs> and I have to absolutely agree. The Waterworld board game is a remarkably unique novelty, not just as a game, but as a movie collectible as well. It truly feels like an artifact from a bygone era when companies, or for that matter of fact, movie-going audiences, were more willing to take big swings on original movie licenses. And as a tabletop novice myself, the fact that the game is easy to learn and quick to play can be actually seen as positives, and I would really love to see how the game plays with some tweaks to the rules. But regardless, I think that for any Waterworld fan, or even any tabletop game fan in general, the Waterworld board game is a great thing to have. If not for its accessibility or reverence for the film that it's based on, then purely for the strange fact that it exists at all. All this Waterworld merchandise and never ceases to amaze me. But there you have it, that is my deep dive into the Waterworld board game. A huge thanks to Rick and Julia for their help on this one. Be sure to check out their podcast, The Mad Max Minute, where they have dissected all four Mad Max movies minute by minute, and in their latest season, have analyzed the Ulysses cut of Waterworld two minutes at a time. Just hours of wonderful discussion and surprise guests, with myself included. That's madmaxminute.com or wherever you stream your podcasts. And so if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and say hello in the comments. I have some really great videos planned for the rest of this year, and it would be wonderful to see the channel surpass 2,000 subs before the end of 2022. So if you haven't already, I would greatly appreciate your subscription. Also, be sure to follow the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content or to reach out to me personally. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.